Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. It's the show where you post questions at the link in the video description, and then I take time out of my busy life to go through and answer them for you for free, because that's just the kind of person that, that I am. It is the last day on my cruise from uh, San Francisco to Alaska. We're now heading back down to San Francisco. Um, got all my bags packed, uh, go to sleep tonight, and then wake up in the morning in San Francisco, fly home to Las Vegas, and then go to New York City uh, for the training class tool that I use, Teachable, is having this summit where a bunch of us who teach classes on Teachable get together and share our tips for how to be better instructors, how to sell things better, all kinds of interesting stuff. So I know I'm not going to record any office hours in New York City because I've tried before and it's always hectic trying to find a location to film, uh, something where I don't get constantly interrupted by people. So I figured I might as well go through and knock out some more of your questions. Tom voted question right now is from Puzzle Land who asks, Hey Brent, my company's licensing budget for SQL Server is small. In those kinds of situations, does it make sense to do new development on something like Postgres? What suggestions would you make to a company that has a small SQL Server licensing budget? Because the first thing I always say is, the biggest cost is often the people, the people who are doing development, database administration, systems administration, whatever. If you take someone who's been doing all their development on SQL Server and then you try to move them to another platform, it's going to be expensive, it's going to be slow, it's going to take time for them to, to get up to speed on that. So what I would say is, if, you, if you're already used to using one database, stay on that database. When you're building brand new stuff, if you're used to SQL Server, just add new databases onto a server that already exists. You don't have to stand up a brand new SQL Server every time you go and build a new application. And when you're just building a new application, odds are its performance needs are very low. It's going to take it time before it amps up to significant needs. So just stick with whatever database you know. And I give that advice to people, whether their favorite database is MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, whatever. Stick with the tool that you know. Next up, let's see here. Uh, I Watch Titanic says, uh, Hi, what are your thoughts on doing index maintenance on indexes with fewer than a thousand pages? Don't bother. Because after all, a thousand pages, it's eight megabytes. Who cares? You can cache that in RAM. I'm not worried about random access to something that's stored in RAM. And if you're hammering the table that hard, the situation or the, the solution isn't defragmentation. The solution is index tuning, putting the right indexes on there so you can seek to the rows that you need. Harminder asks, what's the best way to tune uh, a performance tune, a stored procedure, with thousands of queries due to the heavy use of multiple cursors in a single stored procedure. Well, Parvinder, you've already found that the stored procedure has cursors in it, meaning it operates on a row-by-row -row basis. In that case, when I'm dealing with management who wants me to make it go faster, the way that I ask it to them is, would you like a small incremental performance improvement of, say, 5%, 10%, 20%, or would you like an order of magnitude performance improvement? Now, the order of magnitude one is going to be the one that people notice and they're going to get excited about, and it is going to take more work. And the answer there is to rewrite those cursors into set-based queries. Now, if someone does tell me, I only want a small improvement, all you have to do is give me to 5 or 10%, let's be honest, per vendor, they never actually say that. But if they do say that, I could simply run the query and then run SP Blitz Cache right afterwards, 
and it'll give me at least a rough idea of which statements have been run the most often, which ones have been the most CPU intensive and so forth. But honestly, per vendor, everybody wants the order of magnitude improvement. And that's when you start rewriting that query to become set based. Next up, Olga asks, can we look forward to an office hours hot tub time machine in the near future? Yes. Once my backyard renovation is done, I will absolutely do office hours from the hot tub. I absolutely will. I'm very much looking forward to that because I think it's going to be funny as hell. Next up, Jim asks, what's your opinion of keeping our cloud-based disaster recovery VM undersized on cores and memory and then only upsizing it right before when it's needed? Jim, I'm curious, how do you know when the disaster is going to strike? You said right before it's needed. Jim, how do you do that? Jim, I don't have a lot of money, but if you could show me how to do that, I would like to invest in your company. Now, seriously, Jim, what you really meant is after, after the failover, then you go blow up the number of cores and uh, amount of memory. I am actually a huge fan of that approach. Now, granted, since SQL Server 2019 licensing came out, you're not paying licensing on the secondaries. Now, I'm simplifying this a lot. The disaster recovery secondaries up in Azure that are just used for DR purposes, they're not queried. You don't pay licensing for that, but you still do pay the Azure VM costs, and those can get pretty expensive. So I'm a huge fan of leaving them massively undersized as long as they can keep up with the right workload, W-R-I-T-E, the right workload of replaying, lo excuse me, logs, for example. Magdalena asks a question, and we've had several variations of this question, but she words it a little differently. She says, do you think that chat GPT will someday lead to the demise of Stack Overflow and DBA.StackExchange? I think those two things, I'm going to say no, chat GPT and one specific website. But I'm going to say overall, the ability for text guessing tools, because that's all chat GPT is. It's not artificial intelligence. It's a text generation tool. Do I think that the ability of a text generation tool will replace search uh, engine driven websites? Yes. Because I think if you integrate that better into tools like Visual Studio, uh, into uh, SQL Server Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, if you make it more intuitive for people to ask their questions inside that interface and then never leave that interface, I think that will dramatically change the way that search engine optimization works, the way that uh, websites work. But I think there still has to be a place for people to ask questions and get human help. Because after all, right now, today, tools like ChatGPT, they work really well for older information, but they're not necessarily trained on things that just dropped. For example, try to get help with SQL Server 2022 with a new feature in 2022. And they often just don't have that information. And that's where troubleshooting uh, still is required. But I do think it'll dramatically change the way those businesses work. Anatoly asks, should monitoring for slow queries be a DBA responsibility or a developer responsibility? I believe that the people who should monitor it are the ones who can do something about it. So if you're a production database administrator and you do things like backups and cluster troubleshooting, watching for slow queries doesn't do you any good because you don't have the ability to change those queries. If you're a developer, you do, and you should. If you're a development DBA, then you do have the ability to change those queries and you should. But often when people say DBA, they're using that as shorthand for production DBA. And I don't think they really have any business uh, involved, involved should, should be involved at all in monitoring slow queries. I'll give you an example of why. 
One of my clients has a DBA who's been there for 20 years. Let me rephrase that. He's been working as a database administrator for 20 years. He's been at the company less than that. And before I got involved, this DBA was yelling at the developers, you got to fix these queries. These five queries right here suck. These are the problem. And when I came on site, I was able to look at that DBA's monitoring scripts. He was using SP Blitz Cache, but it didn't work on this server because people were doing option recompile all the time. And the queries that were causing the problem were actually loaded with option recompile. And this DBA never saw them. That DBA was like, wow, I don't even know how you detect queries with option recompile. And if you're a development DBA, that's not a new technology that's been around for a really long time. So you want to make sure that you focus on the things that you're good at and don't try to give people directions when it's not something that it's your specialty. Uh, Anatoly has another uh, question in here. For database administrator type agent jobs like CheckDB, is it better to email on success or on failure? For me, on failure every time. Because if you only alert on success and then you don't, you just don't see that success message come in. Because let's be honest, you've got hundreds of databases, hundreds of servers. You're like, oh, I, I didn't notice that that one email didn't come in. That's where alerting on failure makes so much more sense. Pazulan asks, yo, Brent, does your training cover table partitioning and sliding window partitioning? No. And I'll tell you why. I have hardly ever seen a case where partitioning was the right answer. I have seen cases where it is, but it's like less than 10 times in my entire career, maybe even less than five times. So I don't want to charge people money for training on something that probably isn't the answer. So instead, we give that away for free. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash partitioning, we have a whole resources page out there where you can go and read how partitioning works, get sample instructions on how to uh, implement it. And we also warn you, here are the things that you should look for about your workloads, about your table designs, which mean it probably isn't a good fit for you. I'd rather you learn that something isn't a good fit for free, because I'd feel terrible if I was like, for $1,000, I'll tell you why this won't work. Seems like kind of a bad, uh, bad customer service gig there. Van Yu asks, Hey Brent, have you thought about an appendix to your courses? I need information from several of your videos again, and sometimes it is difficult to find the subjects I am looking for. I think that's a great idea. Um, I didn't used to uh, transcribe my courses because transcription is kind of expensive. It's like a dollar a minute to get good transcription. You can get the AI generated ones and they're garbage. Uh, but to get good transcription, it's around a dollar a minute. Um, and I would roll through, I would re-record my training classes all the time. And so it doesn't make sense to every time I deliver it, pay $60 an hour for fresh translations. Um, but now a lot of the classes are fairly stable. I probably should go back and have them retranslated. I don't know how easy it would be to do a table of, or how, how hard, how easy it would be to do an index. So I'll have to put some thought into that one, but it's a neat idea, I like it. The other option is that you could take notes and actually learn as you go. Did I say that part out loud? Uh, next up, Eduardo says, what is your opinion of a automatic, what is your opinion of availability group automatic page repair? Can it mask more serious hardware problems? Dude, that's the point. Yes, it masks hardware. That, that's the point, dude. What do you want to not mask them? You want to have every time you have a hardware problem, you want to bring the SQL server down? You want something to mask problems. That's the idea of modern technology. That's the idea of RAID cards, of redundant you know, error-correcting memory, 
That's the idea of having multiple engines on an airplane that are redundant. That's, oh my God, where have you been? Yes, that's a good idea. Now, what you're probably really asking, joking aside, is should I be monitoring for hardware failure? Yes, that's why there are uh, dynamic management views for AG automatic page repair, so it tells you when it's happening. You just have to actually listen to those, and when you see that happening, that's your indication that you're having hardware problems or that you're hitting a SQL Server bug. Janice asks, what are your thoughts about setting no count and exact abort to on at the start of each stored procedure? You know, it's funny. I was, uh, for the longest time, I've been working on a course, Fundamentals of Stored Procedures and Triggers, to give people a shell stored procedure so that they understand, here's what I'm setting and here's why I'm setting it. I don't like telling people to just blanket change options because it does change SQL Server's behavior. And if you don't understand how it changes that behavior, that can lead to problems. So I'm a fan of it. I just only want people to do it when they understand how it's changing the behavior of that stored procedure. A fan asks, what's the difference between these two joins with respect to execution plans and performance? Well, compare them. I teach you how to do that in my Fundamentals of Query Plans course, or Fundamentals of Query Tuning course, and Mastering Query Tuning course. I teach you how to compare query plans and execution plan, or and uh, uh, statistics IO, for example, so you can see which ones go faster. Wouldn't it be awesome if you learned how to do that? Click training at the top of the site. Uh, the puzzle on says, hey, Brent, can you recommend any other uh, SQL Server gurus doing this sort of question and answer content uh, on YouTube? No, I, as far as I know, um, Ben Miller does uh, Q&A content on uh, PowerShell. If you search for Ben Miller DBA Duck PowerShell, I don't know if his are up on YouTube or not. I know he does them on Twitch. Uh, but as far as I know, I'm the only one doing it. As far as I know. If you know of any, leave one in the comments. Um, then you asks, Hey Brent, when you tune queries, do you also look at when they're executed? For example, if they're executed by a nightly job, they may not be as important to tune if they run by the application during work hours. Yes, and I teach you how I do that in my class, how I use the first responder kit. It's the first paid class that I recommend anyone taking before they take the rest of my classes. In that one, in the SP Blitz Cache module, I show you how I use the, uh, there's a, set, a minutes back parameter that says, I only want to see queries that have run in the last X minutes. For example, the last 60 minutes or the last 90 minutes. And that's how I can tell which queries are still running actively. And it's so funny. I can't tell you the number of times that clients have said, oh, you don't have to tune that when it only runs overnight. And I look and I'm like, I'll show you right here. It says executed last. And it sh shows the timestamp on there. And I'm like, it's being executed right now. And then it opens up all kinds of interesting questions about, wait, I but we only ran that once a night. It's always really funny. Uh, Rufus asks, I have a stored procedure where we need to build HTML for the email body used by SP Send DB Mail. Do you know of any good T-SQL libraries? No, don't do that. Stop. Put the keyboard down? No. Bad dog? No. Do not build and format HTML in T-SQL. Hear me out for a second. I would show you the scars that I have from doing that, but this is a family show. I have been burned so badly by that. Build HTML in the application tier. The instant that you start finding yourself building HTML in T-SQL, 
you need to swing back and start using something like C Sharp, Java, Perl, anything but T SQL. T SQL is not suitable for that because you're also going to want to do things like robust error handling in the event that the email doesn't get sent correctly. You're going to want logging. You're going to want all kinds of things that we don't have in T SQL. I know because I was in your career spot at one point too. I know that T SQL is your one hammer and you're really good at using that hammer, but it's time to go pick up a screwdriver. I don't mean the drink, although that's excellent as well. Time to go pick up a screwdriver and learn how to use it. You're going to feel like a babe in the woods, but if you need to do email handling, odds are your job title is more of a developer now, not database administrator. Go use a developer tool. That's what they're for. Mary asks, do you ever see a clustered index of a date time followed by an identity column? No. Do you see any good use cases for this potential clustered index? Um, okay. Uh, when, when someone asks me a question, do you, like, do you see any good use cases? I always go, let me struggle to see if I can find one because I bet there is. In this case, the classic example is a data warehouse fact table that uh, clusters on sales date because everybody's reports run by sales date. So five, 10 years ago, the way that you might build that is sales date followed by some other column. It wouldn't be an identity though. Um, these days, if you're gonna do a data warehouse fact table, it's more typical that you would do it in column store anyway. I don't think I've ever seen a good use case for a clustered index of a, a date followed by an identity Maybe someone out in the in the uh, viewership has, and they can leave a comment, but I, I've never seen one. Excuse me. Next up, Larry asks, uh, is Postgres as difficult as SQL Server to pull the actual query parameters from a captured query? Um, I don't know. I've never tried to do that. Uh, so you absolutely have me there. I have totally no clue. Um. Also, I want to Ferrari asks, hi Brent, do you think that working with SQL Server is suitable with having a side hustle? I don't think I understand what that question means. Maybe rephrase the question and I might be able to answer that one, but I, I, don't, I don't exactly understand what you're asking there. Uh, somebody's watching me asks, do you think that Microsoft shares the Azure SQL DMD documentation with SQL monitoring vendors, or do they just figure it out on their own? Um, and I, what, what am I allowed to say here? Uh, Microsoft wants to make it as easy as possible for third-party vendors to build products atop of their own products. Um, so yes, they share documentation, but better than that, and I'm not gonna say that they share better documentation with those vendors uh, than they do with you. The vendors just actually read the documentation. Um, but better than that, Microsoft also will give uh, staff time to outside software vendors to be better partners, to help answer questions, um, to solve uh, challenges that they run into. The bigger the partner is, the more resources that they get. I don't get any. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, C Chubb asks, where do you draw the line in teaching men to fish in regards to helping users with their query performance? What I think you're asking is, do I rewrite queries for people? And it depends on what their career is. We get some users that I work with uh, that are data scientists that are writing a query and they will never write that query again. They're just like, can you make this query run in less time? And I go, sure, no problem. It's going to take me four hours or eight hours or whatever to rewrite it. You authorize that. Yep. So I go off and I rewrite it. 
and I hand them a completed version. With other uh, end users or customers that I have, it's a developer on the other end, and I know that they're going to be working with this query for a long time, that they're going to be working in this company for a long time, that this is a part of the application that they care deeply about. And I'll be like, all right, so I'm going to do a proof of concept rewrite, and then we're going to sit together, and I'm going to talk to you about what parts of this are problematic excuse me, and how we're going to go about fixing them long term. Or sometimes with developers like that, I'll just say, hey, I see that there's a scalar function in the where clause. Has anybody had the scalar function conversation with you before? And they're either like, yes, I know it's a problem, or no, I haven't. I'm like, okay, so let me teach you how to fish. Let me teach you why scalar functions are bad, and then go rewrite it and take that out, and we'll go from there. But it all depends on who the end user is uh, that's on the other end of the desk from me. Also, I want a Ferrari asks, have you had cases where something is bothering you so much that you think you're going crazy, even when trying a very simple thing, it would give you unexpected results? Yes. And I'll give you a great example of it. It's happened many times in my career. I'll give you a great example of it. Um, a couple few months ago, I was working with a client where we were doing load tests and their SQL Server 2016 worked just fine, and their 2019 failed, just completely bombed out, 100% CPU, server would go offline. And I narrowed it down to just one query. I could run just one query, didn't matter which one the query was, and any one query would run faster on SQL Server 2016 than it did on 2019. And I was like, no way, that can't be true. SQL Server 2019 cannot be slower than SQL Server 2016. So then I had to go build VMs and I had to go do test cases and then I had to be really sure about it before I published a blog post. But that was a great example where, and the client footed the bill for me to spend like a week working on that problem, uh, narrowing it down. And we proved out and the community proved out as well that yes, at least on Intel processors, SQL Server 2019 is slower than SQL Server 2016. Now for this client, we ended up solving it via query performance tuning, but the reason they originally came to me was that their 2019 box was falling over and they couldn't figure out why, and that was why, and I was just shocked that that was what the end result was, because I thought there's no way, I can't be seeing this. The client ended up feeling really good about this too. The client was like, Okay, good. We thought we were going crazy, but now it's good to see that you're going crazy, too. Uh, Sean M. says, um, Are the days of SQL agent raising errors over? I'm using Azure SQL DB, and I'm not sure that there's enough value in alerting in Azure SQL DB. Is up-down monitoring good enough? What do you get support calls on? If you get support calls only when the server is down, then up-down monitoring is fine for you. If you get support calls when web pages are slow, reports are slow, processes don't finish, then up-down monitoring may not be enough for you. You may have to also monitor on query response time. And it might sound like I'm being sarcastic, but I have customers who really don't care about query performance time because users are so miserable because they've been accustomed to slow performance. And they're just like, tell us when it's completely broken. Donnie Darko asks, is it safe to invoke SP send DB mail directly or should we abstract it and call a proxy stored procedure to protect against breaking changes in future SQL Server upgrades. I think you should be fine calling that stored procedure directly. The one thing that I would caution you on, though, is that you should only be calling it from utility stored procedures that database administrators, systems administrators run. You should not be using it to send email to end users. Before you use it to send email to end users, that's where you want to be doing that through tools like C Sharp, Java, PHP, whatever. Don't use SQL Server to do that. Well, all right, we've been going for quite a while. I will stop there, and I hope y'all had fun and learned something. 
It's my last day at sea here, and I have about half a bottle of wine left. I don't think I'm going to be able to finish that, but I guess I'm an optimist. I should suppose that I have a can-do attitude. It's only like 6.30 here, so that's probably what I'm going to do is just rearrange this uh, chair and go face the other way and go play uh, Wordscapes for the rest of the afternoon, and I will see you all in the next office hours. Adios.